Chapter Three, Part Two of the Brotherhood of the Seven Kings. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Brotherhood of the Seven Kings by L. T. Mead and Robert Eustace. Chapter Three, The Swing of the Pendulum, Part Two. On the following Thursday morning, I awoke from a disturbed sleep to find London enveloped in one of the thickest fogs that had been known for some years. The limit of my vision scarcely extended beyond the area railings round which the soot-laden mist clung in a breathless calm. In the course of the morning I received a telegram from de Brett. Meet me at the bank, not later than a quarter past four, were the few words which it contained. Soon after three o'clock I started for my destination, avoiding omnibuses and preferring to walk the greater part of the way. I arrived at St. Mark's Court at the time named, and was just approaching the bank when two men knocked violently against me in the thick fog. One of them apologized, but before I could make any reply vanished into the surrounding gloom. I had caught a glimpse of his features, however. He was the Duke of Friedeck. Across the narrow court, at the opposite side of the bank, I saw a stream of light from an open door making a blurred gleam in the surrounding darkness. I crossed the court to see what this indicated. I then discovered that the light came from an old-fashioned eating-house, something in the style of the celebrated cock in Fleet Street. As I stood in the shadow, the two men who had knocked against me entered the eating-house. I returned now to the bank. As soon as I arrived, the manager came up to me. "'Mr. de Brett was called out about a half an hour ago,' he said. "'But he has asked you to wait for him here, Mr. Head. He expects to be back, not later than half-past four. I seated myself accordingly. A clerk brought me the times, and I drew up my chair in front of a bright fire. Now and then someone made a desultory remark about the fog, which was thickening in intensity each moment. The time flew by. The bank, of course, closed at four o'clock, but the clerks were busy finishing accounts and putting the place in order for the night. The different tills were emptied of their contents, and the money was taken down to the great vaults where the different safes were kept. The hands of the clock over the mantelpiece pointed to a quarter to five, when the sound of wheels was heard distinctly outside, and the next moment I saw a splendidly equipped brougham and a pair draw up outside the bank. A footman dismounted, and handed the commissionaire a note. This was brought into the office. It was for me. A clerk gave it to me. I glanced at the writing, and saw that the letter was from de Brett. I tore open the envelope, and read as follows. Dear Head, I have been unexpectedly detained at Lynn's Bank in Broad Street, so have sent the brougham for you. Will you come on at once and pick me up at Lynn's? Please ask Derbyshire, the manager, for the keys of the small safe. He will give them to you after he has locked up the strong room. Yours, Harry de Brett. I turned to the manager. He was an elderly man with grizzled hair and an anxious expression of face. Mr. de Brett wants me to bring the keys of the small safe, I said. I saw the man raise his brows in surprise. That is an unusual request, he answered. But, of course, it must be as Mr. de Brett wishes. As a rule, either Mr. Fromm or I keep the keys, as Mr. de Brett never cares to be troubled with them. Here is his letter, I replied, handing it to the manager. He read it, retaining it in his hand. Do you object to my keeping this, Mr. Head? The request is so unusual that I should like to have this note as my authority. You can certainly keep the note, I said. Very well, sir. I shall have to detain you for a few moments, as we have not quite cleared the tills. The keys of all the other safes are kept in the small one. I will bring you the keys of the small safe in a moment or two. The clerks bustled about, the work of the night was quickly accomplished, and shortly after five o'clock I was seated in de Brett's luxurious brougham with the keys of the small safe in my pocket. We went along very slowly, as the fog seemed to grow thicker each moment. Suddenly, as the coachman piloted his way in the direction of Broad Street, I began to feel a peculiar sensation. My head was giddy, an unusual weakness trembled through my nerves, and for the first time I noticed that the brougham was full of a faint, sweet odour. Doubtless the smell of the fog had prevented my observing this at first. The sensation of faintness grew worse, and I now made an effort to attract the coachman's attention. This I altogether failed to do and becoming seriously alarmed I tried to open the door, but it resisted all my efforts, as also did the windows, which were securely fixed. 
the horrible feeling that I was the victim of some dastardly plot came over me with force. I shouted and struggled to attract attention, and finally tried to break the windows. All in vain. The sense of giddiness grew worse. Everything seemed to whirl before my mental vision. The bank, the brett, the keys of the safe which I had in my pocket, the thought of Geraldine and her danger, were mixed up in a hideous phantasmagoria. The next moment I had lost consciousness. When I came to myself I found that I was lying on a piece of waste ground which I afterwards found to be in the neighborhood of Putney. For one or two moments I could not in the least recall what had happened. Then my memory came back with a quick flash. The Duke of Friedeck, the bank, Geraldine, I said to myself. I sprang to my feet and began a hasty examination of my pockets. Yes, my worst conjectures were confirmed, for the keys of the small safe were gone. My watch and money were intact. The keys alone were stolen. I stood still for a moment, half dazed from the anesthetic fumes, which by some means had been liberated in the brome. Then the need of immediate action came over me, and I made my way at once to the nearest railway station. I found to my relief that it was only a little past eleven o'clock. Beyond doubt, I had recovered consciousness much sooner than the villains who had planned this terrible plot intended. I took the next train to town, and on my way resolved up my line of action. To warn de Brett was impracticable, for the simple reason that he was out of town. To waste time visiting de Freyer was also not to be thought of. Without the least doubt, the bank was in imminent danger, and I must not lose an unnecessary moment in getting to St. Mark's Court. As I thought over matters, I felt more and more certain that the eating-house facing the bank was a rendezvous for Madame's agents. I hastily resolved, therefore, to disguise myself and go there. Once I had belonged to the infamous Brotherhood. I knew their password. By this means, if my suspicions were true, I could doubtless gain admission. As for the rest, I must leave it to chance. As soon as I reached town I drove off at once to a theatrical agent, whose acquaintance I had already made. He remembered me, and I explained enough of the situation to induce him to render me assistance. In a very short time I was metamorphosed. By a few judicious touches twenty years were added to my age. A wig of dark hair completely covered my own. My complexion was dyed to a dark olive, and in a thick travelling coat with a high fur collar I scarcely knew myself. My final act was to slip a loaded revolver into my pocket, and then, feeling that I was prepared for the worst, I hurried forth. It was now between twelve and one in the morning, and the fog was denser than ever. Few men knew London better than I do, but once or twice in that perilous journey I lost my way. At last, however, I found myself in St. Mark's Court. I was now breathing with difficulty. The fog was piercing my lungs and hurting my throat. My eyes watered. When I got into the court I heard the steady tramp of the policeman whose duty it was to guard the place at night. Taking no notice of him, I went across the court in the direction of the eating-house. The light within still burned, but dimly. There was a blur visible, nothing more. This came through one of the windows, for the door was shut. I tapped at the door. A man came immediately and opened it. He asked me what my business was. I repeated the password of the society. A change came over his face. My conjectures were verified. I was instantly admitted. "'Are you expecting to see a friend here to-night?' said the man. "'It is rather late, and we are just closing.' As he uttered the words, like a flash of lightning, an old memory returned to me. I have said that when I first saw the Duke at de Brett's house I was puzzled by an intangible likeness. Now I knew who the man really was. In the old days in Naples an English boy of the name of Drake was often seen in Madame's salons. Drake and the Duke of Friedeck were one and the same. "'I have come here to see Mr. Drake,' I said stoutly. The man nodded. My chance shot had found its belay. "'Mr. Drake is upstairs,' he said. "'Will you find your own way up, or shall I announce you?' "'I will find my own way,' I said. "'He is in the—' "'Room to the front, third floor,' answered the man. He returned to the dining saloon, and I heard the swing door close behind him. Without a moment's hesitation I ascended the stairs. The stairs and passage were in complete darkness. I went up, past the first and second stories, and on to the third. As I approached the landing of the third story, I saw an open door and a gleam of light in a small room which faced the court. The light was caused by a lamp which stood on a deal table, 
the wick of which was turned down very low. Except the lamp and table, there was no other furniture in the room. I went in and looked around me. The Duke was not present. I was just considering what my next step should be, when I heard voices in several steps ascending the stairs. I saw an empty cupboard, the door of which stood ajar. I made for it, and closed the door softly behind me. As the men approached, I slipped the revolver from my pocket, and held it in my hand. It was probable that Friedeck had been told of my arrival. If so, he would search for me, and in all probability look in the cupboard. Three or four men at least were coming up the stairs, and I knew that my life was scarcely worth a moment's purchase. I had a wild feeling of regret that I had not summoned the policeman in the court to my aid, and then the men entered the room. When they did so, I breathed a sigh of relief. They talked to one another as if I did not exist. Evidently, the waiter downstairs had thought that my knowledge of the password was all sufficient, and had not troubled himself to mention my appearance on the scene. One of the men went up to the lamp, turned it on to a full blaze, and then placed it in the window. "'That will be sufficient for our purpose,' he said with a laugh. "'Otherwise, with the fog as thick as it is now, the bolt might miss its mark.' "'The thicker the fog, the better,' said another voice, which I recognized as that of the Duke. "'I am quite ready, gentlemen, if you are.' "'All right,' said the man who had first spoken. "'I will go across to Bell's house and fix the rope from the bar outside the window. As the bob of the pendulum you will swing true, Drake, no fear of that.' You will swing straight to the balcony, as sure as mathematics. Have you anything else to ask? No, answered Friedeck. I am Freddy. Get your part of the work through as quickly as you can. You cannot fail to see this window with the bright light in it. I will have the lower sash open, and be ready to receive the bolt from the crossbow, with the light string attached. That will do the business, answered his confederate. When the bolt reaches you, pull in as hard as you can, for the rope will be attached to the light string. The crossbar is here. You have only to attach it to the rope and swing across. Well, all right, I'm off. The man whose mission it was to send the bolt into the open window now left the room, and I heard his footsteps going softly downstairs. I opened the cupboard door about half an inch, and was able to watch the proceedings of the other three men who remained on the scene. The window was softly opened. They spoke in whispers. I could judge by their attitudes that all three were in the highest state of nervous excitement. Presently a low cry of satisfaction from Friedeck reached my ears, and something shot into the room and struck against the opposite wall. The next moment the men were pulling in a silken string, to which a wire rope was attached. I then saw the Duke remove his coat. A wooden crossbar was securely fastened to the end of the stout rope. The rope was held outside the window by the two Confederates, and the Duke got upon the window sill slipped his legs over the crossbar, and the next instant had disappeared into space. Where he had gone, what he was doing, were mysteries yet to be solved. The men remained for a moment longer beside the window, then they softly closed the sash, and putting out the lamp, left the room. I heard their steps descending the stairs. The sounds died away into utter stillness. I listened intently, and then softly leaving the cupboard approached the window. In the intense darkness caused by the fog, I could not see a yard in front of me. De Brett's bank was in danger. The Duke of Friedeck and his accomplices were burglars. But what the crossbow, the rope, the bolt, the crossbar of wood, and the sudden disappearance of the Duke himself through the open window portended, I could not fathom. My duty, however, was clear. I must immediately give the alarm to the policeman in the court, whose tramp I even now heard coming up to me through the fog. I waited for a few moments longer, and then determined to make my exit. I ran downstairs, treading as softly as I could. I had just reached the little hall, and put my hand on the latch of the door, when I was accosted. "'Who is there?' said a voice. I replied glibly, "'I am going in search of Drake.' "'You cannot see him. He is engaged,' said the same voice. And now a man came forward. He held a dark lantern in his hand, and suddenly threw its bull's-eye full on my face. Perhaps he saw through my disguise. Anyhow, he must have observed my face was unfamiliar to him. The expression on his own changed to one of alarm. He suddenly made a low and peculiar whistle, and two or three other men entered the hall. The first man said something, the words of which I could not catch, and all four made a rush for me. But the door was on the latch. I burst it open and escaped into the court. The thick fog favored me, and I hoped that I had escaped the gang when a heavy blow on the back of my head rendered me, for the second time, 
within that ominous twenty-four hours, unconscious. When I awoke, I found myself in the ward of a London hospital, and the kind face of a house-surgeon was bending over me. "'Ah, you'll do,' I heard him say. "'You're coming too nicely. You had a nasty blow on your head, though. Don't talk at present. You'll be all right in a couple of hours.' I lay still, feeling bewildered. Figures were moving about the room, and the daylight was streaming in at the windows. I saw a nurse come up and look at me. She bent down. "'You feel better? You are not suffering?' she said. "'I am not,' I replied. "'But how did I get here? What has happened?' "'A policeman heard you cry, and picked you up unconscious in a place called St. Mark's Court. Someone gave you a bad blow on your head. It is a wonder your skull was not cracked. But you are better. Have you a message to give any one?' "'I must get up immediately,' I said. "'I have not a moment to lose. Something dreadful has happened, and I must see to it. I must leave the hospital at once.' "'Not without the surgeon's permission,' said the nurse. "'Have you any friend you would like to be sent to you?' I mentioned Dufrayer's name. The nurse said she would dispatch a messenger immediately to his house, and ask him to come to me. I waited with what patience I could. The severe blow had fortunately only stunned me. I was not seriously hurt and all the events of the preceding night, previous to the blow, presented themselves clearly before my memory. In a little over an hour Dufrayer arrived. His eyes were blazing with excitement. He came up to me, full of consternation. "'What has happened, Head?' he asked. "'Oh, I am all right. Don't bother about me,' I said. "'But listen, Dufrayer. I must go to St. Mark's Court immediately. There is mischief.' "'St. Mark's Court? Are you mad? Have you heard anything?' "'Heard what?' I asked. "'They have done it, that's all,' cried Dufrayer. "'What?' I exclaimed. "'Well, there's the very devil to pay in the city this morning. De Brett's bank was broken into last night, the night watchman seriously injured, and securities and cash to the tune of one hundred thousand pounds taken from the strong-room, and the man has got clean away. Your messenger from here followed me to the bank. Tyler is there, and De Brett. The daring of the robbery is unparalleled.' "'I can throw light on this matter,' I said. "'Get the surgeon to give me leave to go, Dufrayer. There is not a moment to lose if we are to catch the scoundrel. I must accompany you to the bank.' "'Well, you seem all right, old chap, and if you have anything to say—' "'I have!' I cried impatiently. "'See the surgeon. I must get off immediately.' Dufrayer did as I requested him. The surgeon shook his head over what he called my imprudence, but said he could not detain me against my will. Dufrayer and I stepped into a hansom and on my way to the bank I repeated my strange adventures of the previous night. "'Did ever any one hear of another man doing such a foolhardy thing?' cried Dufrayer. "'What possessed you to enter that hell alone beats my comprehension.' "'Never mind that now,' I replied. "'Remember, I knew the Brotherhood. My one chance consisted in going alone. Thank goodness the fog has risen.' A light breeze was blowing over the city, and as we entered St. Mark's Court, a ray of sunshine cast a watery gleam over the old smoke-begrimed buildings. We entered the bank and found De Brett, his manager, two police inspectors, and Tyler's agent awaiting us. De Brett exclaimed when he saw sight of me, "'Ah, oh, Head, here's a pretty business. I'm a ruined man. The bank cannot stand a blow of this kind.' "'Courage,' I replied. "'We may be able to put things right yet. I have a story to tell. Mr. Derbyshire, you have doubtless kept the note which Mr. De Brett wrote to me last night?' "'The note I wrote to you?' cried De Brett. "'What do you mean?' "'Will you produce the note?' I said to the manager. The man brought it and put it into his chief's hand. De Brett read it with increasing amazement. "'But I never put pen to paper on such a fool's errand,' he cried. "'Why, I never take the keys of the small safe. Derbyshire and Fromm have charge of them. Head, this note is a forgery. What in the name of heaven does it mean?' "'It meant for me a brome which was a death-trap,' I replied and it also meant the most dastardly scheme to rob you, and perhaps murder me, which has ever been conceived. But listen, let me tell you my story. I did so, amidst the breathless silence of the spectators. And now, I continued, the best thing we can do, gentlemen, is to go across to the house from which the bolt was shot. It is possible that we may see something in that upper room which will explain the manner in which the burglar entered the bank." "'I am at your service, Mr. Head,' said Inspector Brown, in a cheerful tone. "'A mystery of this sort is quite to my mind. All the same, sir,' he continued, as he and I took the lead of the little procession which crossed St. Mark's Court. "'I cannot imagine how any man got into that window of the bank on the second floor without wings. 
There is a constable on patrol in the court all night, so ladders are out of the question. The annihilation of gravity is a new departure in the burglar's art. We had now reached the building which faced the court, and which was between the bank and the eating-house. It was composed entirely of offices. We went up at once to the top floor. The door of the room which faced the court was locked. The inspector took a step back, and flinging his shoulders against it, it flew open. The room was bare and unoccupied, but as we entered, Inspector Brown uttered a cry. "'Here is the confirmation of your story, Mr. Head.' As he spoke, he lifted up a coil of strong rope, which lay in a corner of the room. Attached to it was a crossbar of wood. A strong iron bar with a hook at one end, and a crossbow also lay in the neighborhood of the rope. "'The thing is as clear as daylight,' I exclaimed. I could not put two and two together last night, for the fog fairly bewildered me, but now I see the whole scheme. Let me explain. This rope was sent by means of the crossbow across to the window in the eating-house. To the bolt of the crossbow was attached a silken cord, to which again the rope was fastened. The man who swung himself out of the window by the rope last night acted as the bob of the pendulum, and so reached the window of the bank. Swinging through the eating-house window, and rising to the balcony opposite the bank window, he then doubtless seized the handle of the outside frame, and settling on the balcony, cut out the glass with a diamond. "'We will go at once and see the room in the eating-house,' said the inspector. We did so, and found to our amazement that the door of the eating-house was locked, and the place empty. After some slight difficulty, we got the door burst open, and went upstairs. Here we found the final confirmation of my words— the silken string which had been attached to the rope, and cut from it before the Duke made his aerial flight. "'But who did it?' cried de Brett. "'We must secure the scoundrel without a moment's delay, for, amongst other things, he has stolen the Duke of Friedeck's priceless securities, the diamonds. By the way,' continued the banker, "'where is the Duke? I sent him a telegram, and expected him here before now.' An ominous silence fell upon every one. De Brett's face grew white. He looked at me. "'For God's sake, speak!' he cried. "'Have you anything else to confide?' "'You must be prepared for bad news, De Brett. I said. I went up and laid my hand on my old friend's shoulders. Thank God I was in time. Your little girl is saved from the most awful fate which could overtake any woman. The man who committed the burglary was known to you as the Duke of Friedeck. De Brett stepped back. His face changed from white to purple. "'Then that accounts for the telegrams,' he said. I received two yesterday, one from you telling me to expect you by a late train at Forest Manor, the other from that scoundrel. In it he said that he was unexpectedly detained in town. Doubtless both telegrams were sent by the same man. Without doubt, I replied, the whole thing was carefully planned, and not a stone left unturned to secure the success of this most dastardly scheme. But to Brett I have one more thing to say. There is no Duke of Friedeck. It was an assumed name. I am prepared to swear to the man's real identity when the police have secured him. The remainder of this story can be told in a few words. The ruffian who had posed as the Duke of Friedeck was captured a few days later, but the greater part of the securities and money which he had stolen were never recovered. Doubtless Madame Colucci had them in her possession. The man passed through his trial and received his sentence, but that has nothing to do with the story. By the energetic aid of his many friends, de Brett escaped ruin, and his bank still exists and prospers. He is a sadder and a wiser man. End of chapter 3